Hi community, big, big welcome. Thank you so much for pressing play. My name is Kristen Skelton. I'm the founder of Bud Funding and here we're all about helping you live your best sustainable life. And in today's video, we are gonna be talking all about seed saving. But before we dive right in, thank you so much for pressing play, commenting and sharing these videos because when you do that, you help Bud funding grow, but also ripple the positive effects of sustainability around the globe. So thank you so much for helping us to spread that message. And today I have a special guest with me. I have Kathy Parsons and she's joined me once before for a awesome composting video. So if you haven't watched that, I will link that in the description of this video. It is your one-stop shop, everything you need to know to get started with a compost so definitely give that a watch but um yes yeah, so i have kathy back here with me and kathy has been a passionate uh advocate for no dig gardening for more than 25 years and planted her first urban food forest in 2008 kathy how are you doing today i'm doing pretty good spring is in the air so <laughs> Yes, it is. It's feeling great. And so today we're going to be talking all about seed saving. So my first question, Kathy, is what kind of garden plants can I save seeds from? Oh, there's just such a whole host of garden plants that you can save seeds from. And um, uh, it only differs um, in how you save those seeds and um you know, some things are far easier to do than others need a little bit more, um, you know, technique to know. But there's uh, um, a whole host of things. One of the main things um, to know is um, what kind of plant that you're actually gaining a, you know, trying to gain seeds some from. So we typically think about saving seeds from vegetables or perhaps flowers. Um, and so most of those are um, we think of vegetables in particular as being annuals um, but you can save seeds from you know annual annuals and then there's biennials who grow one year and then in their second year produce seed and then there's of course perennials so then they each you know kind of are a little bit um, different so for for an annual um, those would be your typical things like lettuce and spinach um, tomatoes, um, those kinds of things. But some people might not realize that things like carrots, onions, and beets are all biennial. So you have to take them through one growing season into another and they'll produce seed the second year. And then of course there's perennials, which are, you know, a number of the, you know, flower kinds of things that we have in our garden that come up from year to year and continue to produce. So you can save seed from all those things. And there's things like fruit trees as well that you can, you know, you might want to save seed from. But of course, they all have different um, boundaries around how well that will work. For apple seeds, for example, um, they do not produce true from seed. So they need to be cross-pollinated from another um, fruit, well, apple tree. And then you're not sure what you're going to get. It doesn't mean that's not going to produce a good apple. It just isn't going to be like the parent apple tree that you have. So if you're growing a Macintosh apple and you save a seed from that, you're not going to necessarily get a Macintosh apple. So, um, you know, you just have to be aware of those kinds of things. Um, so open pollinated is probably something that everyone sees on their seed packages. And that's the most um, reliable kind of seed that you want to save. If you save seeds from a hybrid, Again, it's not going to be like the parent plant. It might be a perfectly good plant, but it's if you're trying to replicate what you have, that's not going to happen if you use hybrid seed. So you want to have something that's open pollinated. So something like uh, spinach, for example, um, you might have, you know, a little plot of spinach seeds that are spinach plants that you want to go to seed. They'll kind of pollinate amongst themselves. And they all have different characteristics, but they're all the same kind of spinach. So for try, trying to help people to understand that, um, let's take dogs, for example. So you can look at 15 different, I don't know, types of, a, you know, a particular dog. And they all have similar characteristics. So when you look at it, you know it's that kind of dog. 
but they're all kind of different. Some are a little taller, some are a little shorter, some might have a broader face, some have different coloring, but they're all the same kind of dog. Same with open pollinated. So if you take a, you know, a particular breed of dog and you breed it to that same breed, you're going to get the same breed. Same with your tomatoes, for example. If you, you know, have a beefsteak tomato and it's around beefsteak tomatoes, you're going to get a beefsteak tomato out of those plants or out of those seeds. Um, and that's kind of how that open pollinated works. So the characteristics are similar enough in open pollination that you can identify that it's a Roma tomato as opposed to a beefsteak, but that their gene genes aren't an exact replica of it. It's not a, they're not a clone. If you want to clone something, you have to make a tomato, you have to take a, you know, a, a branch off of that tomato plant and get it to root, and then you have a clone. That's what they do with um, fruit trees. Mm -hmm. They basically clone them. So open pollinated keeps your genetics strong, keeps the characteristics of, the, of that particular variety strong. If you just continue to use exactly the same plant um, to pollinate, you're going to start to lose characteristics and that that particular strain will weaken. So it's good to have a variety of, even if it's the same plant or the same variety, you have a good number of them together and you keep those um, genetic characteristics strong. In the case of something like a biennial, if you want to have carrot seeds, you're going to have to find a way to winter that carrot that grew the first year and then be able to have it grow again and produce seeds. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can leave it in the ground and protect it from freezing, which I have done. Depending on what zone you're in, that's harder to do maybe in zone one than it is where I am or in zone four. Um, or you can pull the carrot and keep it um, cool over the winter, just like you would store your carrots. And you might notice some of your carrots in the spring get the little white roots on them or whatever. That's because it's getting ready to grow again. You can plant that. And this next year it will continue to grow but it will produce seeds the roots no longer edible because it gets very woody but you will get seeds out of it so that's kind of how biennials um, work and then the ones that are annuals are you know as long as the seed is mature they grow flower produce a seed and then you harvest it that fall before winter comes and then you've got good seed for for the next year so that's kind of some of the main things that you want to worry about and then you also want to have to start to worry about some things like with squash plants they very readily cross pollinate but if they're different types of squash it's the seed that will express that cross not the fruit of that year lots of people get confused about that where they get something that doesn't quite look like the squash they thought they planted and they think it's cross pollinated in their garden in that year that's not how that works so regardless of what pollinated that particular flower it will produce a spaghetti squash if that's what you planted but it's the seed from that sp spaghetti squash next year that might be a cross of whatever type of squash that that pollinated it so in the case of those kinds of things um, there's a number of techniques that you can do to um, try to safeguard um, the plants that you intend for producing seed. So with a squash, for example, you can have um, distance um, to try to prevent, you know, some other kind of squash from pollinating your spaghetti squash seeds. Um, and But then you're kind of vulnerable to pollinators. So bees travel up to five miles. So you can't guarantee that there's not another spaghetti squash. So in that particular case, what I do is I hand pollinate it and then I cover it with a bag, like one of those organza bags. Mm -hmm. That protects it from being pollinated by anything else. It'll store or it'll, you know, grow its fruit. And then um, you'll hopefully have spaghetti squash next year. Because, <laughs> you, you know, that's that was the intention. Um, most other plants, just a little bit of difference. Peas, for example, um, I will... Um, you know, keep maybe six feet between various rows, various varieties in order to just try to keep it as pollinated as possible or as true as possible to what I'm, I'm trying to reproduce. Tomatoes, they pretty much, even peppers, um, they tend to self-pollinate. 
um, so or wind pollinate. So they will, um, you know, the pollen from up above falls down and, and pollinates the ones down below. So you don't need as much dis distance. Peppers, I would give a little bit more distance um, in order to uh, try to make sure so that like my hot peppers aren't crossing with my sweet peppers. So when I'm planting, you know, the seeds next year, I don't end up with all hot peppers because, you know, my bowels crossed with my hot peppers. <laughs> so, um, you know, just try to keep some of those kinds of things in mind um, when you're, you know, picking various things to try to try to pollinate. It sounds complicated, but it's really not if you just start with some simple things and then you can grow your knowledge. OK, this year I want to do peppers. So learn all you can about peppers and you know do that and then you can kind of have things on the go the other thing to consider is you, you have to have enough plants so it's not usually good to just have a carrot um, again we're sort of talking about that trying to get the genetic diversity within that variety so mm -hmm. you want to have a few um, carrots on the go and it depends too on how much seed you want you don't want a 50 row um, a 50 foot row of seed carrots unless you want a lot of seed <laughs> so you know you might get away with four feet or six feet or whatever you think um, will be something that you um, you know will be able to use in a reasonably you know short period of time so that's the some of the basics around um, things that you um, can save seed from and yeah. Well, that's interesting what you said about the apples because I, I had I saved a, a lemon seed and I put it in my hydroponic system and I just had like a little one and it started to grow a plant and I was like oh I'll try it with the apple, and I put it in there and I waited and I waited like a month and nothing happened so yes I, it, it definitely did not sprout anything and I had to take it out. So. And that that's the other thing too to think about because. Um, in order for the seed to be viable, the fruit has to be mature. So especially when you're buying like something that was produced commercially, often they will pick it before it's ripe, keep it in really super cool storage, and then, you know, let it ripen a bit until they mm -hmm. put it out to the shelf. So the fruit is ripe enough to eat, but it's not ripe enough to take seed from. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure things like squash and um, tomatoes, those kinds of things, you have to make sure that the fruit's actually mature before you will take those seeds. Okay, good to know. So how do I know when to harvest the seeds? Well, that's the big question. <laughs> um, I kind of touched on that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so um, something like, um, say uh, spinach or radishes or those kinds of things, they have, um, you know, seeds or pods that you can see very clearly. And typically once they've turned brown, they're mature. Okay. And so you'll know when they're kind of crunchy. The trick in that, it might be not so much spinach, but say for um, the um, radish or even some of your flower seeds that come in the little pod, because the pod is intended to hold the seeds and then once it's mature it breaks open and spreads the seeds you have to get it so it's dry enough to know that it's mature but before it pops open to distribute its seeds even poppies will do that mm -hmm. where it will open up and distribute seeds on its own so once you start to see it getting kind of brown or whatever the pod or the flower head you want to make sure you kind of keep an eye on it and sometimes even like pansies I have a hard time catching those at the right moment. So as I see it starting to brown, if I want seeds from that, then I will put one of those little organza bags or something like even a paper bag over the, a few of the pods so that this they you know fly open and they'll put the seeds in the bag and then you don't lose them because it's really frustrating sitting there and waiting and mm -hmm. then you go to collect your seed and all your pods are popped <laughs> and your seeds mm -hmm. are gone. So. Yeah, I mean, they'll come up wherever they landed, but not into your, you know, seed container. So for other things like um, squash seeds, tomato seeds, those kinds of things, if you let the fruit go to as, as ripe as you can without it being rotten, you're usually good. Um, there is a, 
sort of a test if they'll, you know, if you put them in water, the, the common theory is, is that the, the floaters are not viable seed and the ones that sink are. And the ones that float are lighter because it's not a fully mature seed or it didn't quite, you know, get pollinated if it's something that's, you know, in a, like corn or something that's in rows. So that's one way that you can, you know, tell once you've dried your seeds and stuff like that, if you, or once you've collected them, that's one method that you can use. And some things like squash and tomatoes and stuff, you kind of want to wash anyway, because they're very sticky. And if you try to spread them out on paper towel or something to dry, they will stick to the paper towel. So that's typically, you know, if the fruit's um, about as far gone as you would let it go before you'd want to eat it, then usually it's mature. Okay. And so once I have the seeds, what's the proper protocol in terms of storing them? Um, I, yeah, I think you want to um, get your seeds and there's, there's sort of a process for cleaning. As I just mentioned, there's like your tomato seeds and your squash seeds and the ones that are like wet seed mm -hmm. because they're in a pulp um you want to be able to wash those off uh figure out your sinkers and your floaters and then put them where they can thoroughly dry um and there are you know there's lots of things on the internet that you can read where you you know put the pulp of the seeds in it and let it ferment for three days and then you wash it or whatever you can certainly do that and i used to do that and i think part of that was able to get some of that sort of slime coating that are on the seeds that help to protect it in, you know, normal atmosphere where they would just, you know, the tomato would fall to the ground and then it would sprout the next season kind of thing. When you're dry storing them, you don't really need that protection. Um, but I found just being able to wash them off to be adequate. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't really affected my germination over the years. So um there's no harm in doing it but it's just one more step i kind of try to eliminate there's going to be things like um when you harvest uh spinach seeds for example you often get a lot of chaff in there um you don't really need to be storing all that so i i like to clean my seeds and separate that all out um so i'll do things if there's a light breeze you can kind of do like the old-fashioned winnowing where you kind of throw them up in the air from a basket or something and let the light breeze blow away the chaff or you can blow on them to blow away the chaff so all you're storing is the seed and I typically will leave seeds out a minimum of three weeks to dry before I ever put them in any kind of storage so if I know that they are fully dry if you don't they will mold and so that's you know that's not something obviously that's desirable um and there's kind of a difference in, you know, maybe how I store some seeds over others. Um, things like spinach and small seeds, like, um, uh, I don't know, pansies, something like that. I tend for some reason to put those into envelopes where they're easier to manage. If I've got something that's bulkier, like beans or peas or whatever, I will leave those sometimes in their pods in a, in a paper bag somewhere until like after Christmas. And then once Christmas is cleared away, then it's time. It's sort of um, scratching my gardening itch while I'm waiting for us, you know, to be able to actually garden. So then I'll I'll drag them out, you know, and watch a movie or something like that in the night. And and um, and then this way they've been sitting for several months. I know they're dry. I can you know crack open the pods, get the the seeds out of the shells, and then I'll you know store those in a like an old baby food jar or a yogurt container or some, you know, some kind of container that I can recycle to use. And I know for sure they're dry enough that they can go into that and, and not have any issues with it being, you know, getting mold or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So once you've got them in whatever containers, um, there's lots of people that will save their seeds in the freezer. Um, I don't typically do that, though there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of the seed vaults and stuff like that keep them at a, at a pretty low temperature. Um, freezer space is awfully valuable at my house, so I, I tend not to, you know, lose them somewhere in the freezer. So I typically, um, I just have shoe boxes, to be honest, and they get stacked according to, you know, type or whatever all together. And they go into a cool, dark place. A, a cold room is perfect. Um, a shelf in the basement somewhere, 
um, and they they should be good for many many years that way. Okay, and so my last question was: um, Is there any way to know if the seeds that are saved are ready to go? Is it just like a certain amount of time? Like you said, you, it, you let them dry out for a certain couple of you know weeks. Is there a way to like look at them and know, or is it just yes, a certain amount of time has passed, and so I know that they're good to good to be planted? Typically, what I'll do is when I know I'm going to start, you know wanting to think about pre-starting some things like my tomatoes and my peppers and stuff like that and usually it's after you know when i've done my you know the christmas thing is over i've shelled my peas or my beans and you know cleaned up whatever it is i've collected i will do seed germination tests and then that way i know so typically what i'll do is take 10 seeds just because it's an easy way to get percentages if you use 10. <laughs> so if i'm testing squash for example i'll take 10 squash seeds i'll put them in a, a damp um, paper towel or something like that stick them into a container and give them a few days and see what sprouts if only three sprout then i know my germination is only about 30 percent and that's very low so with squash um, you would have the advantage of being able to um, no, I mean, it's not like you need 500 squash seeds in a year where you might need 500 carrot seeds, for example. Mm -hmm. So I just test each one and see how well they germinate and then I know how to plant from there. And if, you know, if you start to get below, you know, 70% um, or 60%, you would want to plant more thickly. There's nothing wrong with, you know, you can still use those seeds. You don't have to garbage them. But just know that it's going to take more seeds to get what you want. So when they're older, just plant more thickly or plant more of them. You know, if you're starting tomatoes and I only got 70% germination, well, okay, I'm going to plant a few more. If I wanted 10, I'm going to make sure that I plant more just so I make sure I get the 10. And that's the best way to actually know whether your seed is viable or not. Okay, awesome. Kathy, thank you so much for joining me again. You are so knowledgeable and you explain everything really, really well, which I really appreciate for, you know, people that are just getting into gardening or composting. So I just want to thank you so much for joining me again. I really appreciate you and your knowledge and um, your support of the Bud Funding community. Anytime. I'm happy to talk about any topic and I'll look forward to the video being um put up and then if anybody has questions we can do some follow-up yeah if anyone has questions please put them in the in this video wherever you find it and we'll get back to you with some answers and of course if you have any suggestions for future topics that you would like maybe me and kathy to cover definitely put them in the comments section as well um have everyone out there please have a wonderful day and i will see you community next week thank you so much for being part of the bud funding community bye for now bye bye